say that tongue tied. Thank you, God. Thank you. I was praying a couple weeks ago, and you know how God speaks to us in a small, still voice, and very quietly? But it wasn't this way this time. It was direct, it was loud, and it was very firm. And what he spoke to my heart is, do not forget to wear the armor. Do not forget to wear the armor. And the first thing that came to me is, I must be prepared for battle. Must be prepared for battle. And being prepared for battle, do, do you, you all know, I know you all know this, that you're in the army of God, right? You are in the armies of the living God. And why do we know that? Because the word tells us that we need to wear armor, doesn't it? The word tells us that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So we have to take a stand against the devil's schemes. We're in the army of God. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. When we were in uh, Israel, we were in the Holocaust Museum. It's, 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 it's a tough thing to go through. It, it was just really very hard. But they take everyone that comes uh, to visit. That's one of the places that you will be at is the Holocaust Museum. And not only do you go to the Holocaust Museum, but they actually pay for any um, Jewish people living in America or anywhere else that wants to come to Israel, and the first place they go is to the Holocaust Museum. Their uh, military goes into the Holocaust Museum. And when we were there, the military was there. Uh, their military is mandatory, women two years, men four years. And all the youngsters, young kids in uniform, were going through the Holocaust Museum. And when I looked at them, I, I was, they were kids. Of course, the older I get, the younger everybody else looks. So, but they were kids, 18, 19 years old, and they were going to the Holocaust Museum. And the reason for that is that the Israelites don't want to forget what happened so that it never happens again. Okay? So when we're in the military, basically when we're serving the Lord, we're not going to allow the enemy to get away with what he wants to get away with. Amen? So by wearing that full armor, being prepared for battle, gets us prepared for what we need to do. Now, I really had a laugh because after God spoke to my heart and reminded me not to forget to wear the armor, I sat down to do my usual reading. And it was just a succession of where I was at, and I came to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I think all of you know what that chapter is, and it's David and Goliath. And I had a laugh because I thought that has to be the most teeth taught, the most taught um, chapter in the Bible. Even unsafe people all know about David and Goliath. I mean, that is something. And I wasn't planning on teaching it, but as I began to read David and Goliath, I began to see things I didn't see before. And I want to bring it to you. And I know we all heard of David and Goliath, but I hope that I can bring some insights and things that will encourage you, having done all to stand, stand. Now, the thing that came to me, two things I want to point out to you, is that in the eyes of God, there is no Goliath. Goliath does not exist in the eyes of God. Amen. The second thing is we need to understand is how do Goliaths become so big in our eyes? How does that happen? And that's what we want to look at. How does he become so big in our eyes? And before I get into the actual teaching, I just want to give you a little bit of background so that it can all fit in. And Saul was anointed king of Israel. The Israelites wanted a king. And I'm just going to cut through because this is not what I want to teach, but you can do a whole teaching in that alone. Uh, Saul was called to be king, and Samuel anointed him to be king. And 
Saul was doing okay up until some points where he began to do things his own way. He became disobedient and he didn't obey the word of the Lord. And God repented in his heart that he had called Saul to be king. And he told Samuel, I have repented that I have called Saul to be king and I will be removing him from where he is. Um, on this occasion, uh, Samuel was with Saul and he was addressing the fact that Saul did not obey the word of God and told him that the kingdom would be taken from him. Now, Saul, when I read this, he was sorry. I didn't see any repentance in his heart. He had a rebellious heart, and when Samuel turned to walk away, Saul grabbed him, and his garment was torn, and Samuel said, the kingdom will be torn from you, that you will no longer be king. Saul went his way, Samuel went his way, and God spoke to Samuel and said, I want you to anoint a new king. Go to the house of Jesse. So Samuel went to the house of Jesse. Jesse's son stepped before him. Not one of them fit the bill. And Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any other children? He said, yes, I have one more son who's out in the sheep fold. Out in, out in, uh, he's a shepherd. They, they didn't even invite him to the feast. He said, we're not going to sit down until he comes in. When Samuel saw David, he knew that that was God's anointed, and he anointed him to be king over Israel. David turned and went back to the sheepfold to shepherd the flock. But I want you to understand this about David. He was a worshiper. He loved his God with all his heart and all his mind and all his soul. And God said that David was a man after his own heart. Before he anointed David king, David was out on the shepherd, uh, shepherding in the sheep pen, praising the Lord and playing his heart and giving God worship. And what happened with Saul is that an evil spirit came on Saul. And he was advised to have a, a worshiper come and worship over him, and David was advised to come. So David came, and he worshiped God on behalf of Saul so that the evil spirit would leave Saul. And David went back and forth between the sheepfold and praying over Saul. Now one day, um, David's father asked him to go out to the battlefields where his brothers were because his brothers were in the army of the Lord. And what was happening is the Israelites and the Philistines were getting ready for battle. The Philistines had been oppressing the Israelites for some time. And he asked David to take out supplies to his brothers. So this day, David got some supplies and he went out to the battle lines. And what we see is that the Israelites were on one side of the hill and the Philistines were on the other side of the hill. I'll tell you, being out in Israel, you see things so differently. The country out there is all hills. It is hill. It's rock. You're standing on rock. You're standing on hills. And in the middle was a valley. And in verse 4 of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 4, we get a picture of Goliath. Uh, and what we see here is that Goliath steps out from the Philistines. Now, Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. Now, you saw me standing next to Kobe, right? Kobe's a big guy. Goliath would have three more feet on him. Just think of it, three more feet. I came up to Kobe's chest area. The biggest guy, if he was six nine, would come up to here, to Goliath. Okay, so Goliath, was big, he was intimidating, and he wore a bronze helmet, and he wore a bronze suit of armor that weighed 125 pounds. Amazing. He had a spear that he slung on his shoulder, and they said it was like a weaver's beam. It was huge, it was big, and the shaft was 15 pounds. And he wore ar uh, armor leggings um, that were bronze as well. And he came out with a booming voice, and he challenged the armies of Israel. And he said, I'll tell you what, send someone out to fight me. And if you win, we'll be your slaves. But if I win, you be our slaves. Now Goliath knew something. He was big, and he figured he's going to win. He figured hands down, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's a seasoned warrior. He knows that he, he's a stronger. Bigger, hands down, he knows he can win. So I want to pick up 
up at verse 10 here? The verses, and it says, Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let him fight, and let us fight each other. On hearing, okay, on hearing this, Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. How do our Goliaths get so big in our eyes? Through words. We feed Goliaths with our words. Goliath spoke words that went forth and caused dismay and terror in the armies of the Israelites. Now you're talking about warriors, seasoned warriors, who are terrified and dismayed. Not only are they terrified and dismayed, but they should remember that they're the army of Israel. They are the army that God brought through the Red Sea. They are the army that conquered Jericho and watched the walls fall down. Their forefathers passed this on to them. They forgot that God moved in so many different ways, and every time they served their God, they won every battle. They conquered and they took territory. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, what happened? What happened? They were terrified. They were dismayed. Words have power. And I want you to understand something. We are made in the image of God. Amen. When God created us, he gave us words. He gave us the power and authority of the spoken word. He gave that to us. And when he gave us the power and authority of the spoken word, we see that when God it said in uh, um, Hebrews 11, verse 3, that the worlds were formed by the word of God. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and we had the worlds formed. Amen? He created. When we speak words of authority, we speak the reality into our lives. We've got to understand that. We speak reality into our lives. In James, it tells us that the tongue is likened to a rudder of a huge ocean liner. You got a rudder, rudder, and if you turn that, the rudder can turn that huge ocean liner to the left or to the right. The analogy is, is that our tongue, through our words spoken, can turn the whole body to the left or to the right to make decisions, to see things. And it is with those words that we need to understand that words have power no matter who speaks them. Words have power. Words can create. Words can destroy. Words can build up. They can tear down. Words can make sick or they can heal. Words can be like flaming arrows going into the heart. Amen. Or words can become prophetic, promoting healing and empowerment in our lives. Thank you, Lord. The choice is ours. Proverbs 14, 12 says that we eat the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our words will be where we are at. Prosperity or poverty. What are we speaking to ourselves? And what we see here with the Israelites and with Saul is they are terrified by the words that Goliath was speaking. Remember, there is no Goliath in the eyes of God. And Goliath cannot prevail over us when we have God behind us and for us. Amen? Amen. The next thing I want to point out, and I'm going to bounce over to verse 24, and it says, in verse 24, whenever the Israelites saw the man, meaning Goliath, they all fled from him in great fear. The terror is going to fear. Now we're going to go, when they saw Goliath, they saw Goliath. How does the Goliath get so big? 
What do you envision in your mind? What do you see? Do you see the circumstances or do you see what God said about those circumstances? Do you see that x-ray or do you see what God says about that x-ray? Do you see the report or do you see what God says about that report? The thing here is that the Israelites were falling for that. They looked at Goliath, they saw his strength, they saw how big he was, and in their mind's eye, they already, Goliath was no longer nine feet, nine inches in their minds. Goliath may as well have been 15 feet now. We can build things up in our mind so that we see our Goliaths. I chose a long time ago not to deal with my Goliath. That's why I'm standing here preaching. I dealt with that fear. Amen. And it's the same for you as well. But the Israelites fell for the old thing. When the Israelites were to go into the promised land and they went into the spy out the promised land, what did they come back and say? There's giants in the land, we can't do it. And here we're back again. There's giants in the land, we can't do it. Again, they went by what they saw, not by what God said. And that we need to envision in our hearts and in our minds what God is telling us about ourselves. Kenan Bridges had a vision one, one evening, and he saw this glorious person standing before him, arrayed in full armor, tall, powerful, Leaning with the power of God. And he said, God, is that an angel? And God said, no, that's you in your armor. Amen. That's you in your armor. Glory. And that's what we need to know. So our lives are fed by the words that we hear and the faith that we put in those words or by what we see and the circumstances of what we see rather than what God sees and what God wants. <coughs> and then I want to bounce over now to verse 16, and it says, For forty days, Goliath came out in the morning and at night, and he took his stand. He came out every morning and every night, and he took his stand, and he shouted these words. Now, the Israelites are hearing this, okay? And what he does is he has the audacity to defy the armies of the living God, and he takes his stand. You know what it means to take a stand? It means to be firmly planted with a reason and a purpose. To be firmly planted. Goliath came out and he was firmly planted with a reason and a purpose. What reason and what purpose does the enemy have for us? To steal what God gives you. To take what God has abundantly blessed you with. Helen said it all. What was going on with Helen? She was being attacked. She wore the full armor, and the word of God delivered her. Right? Amen. Come into your rest, O oh my soul. And I will deal bountifully with you. The enemy doesn't want you to have the bounty. He doesn't want you to have the blessings. So he's firmly planted. But I want to tell you, guess who else is firmly planted? We are. The Israelites weren't at this point. Not at this point. But we are. And I want to read from Ephesians uh, chapter 6 and verse 13. And it says, Therefore, put on the full armor. It's reminding us that again. Put on the full armor. So that when the, de when the day of evil comes, put on the full armor. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you stand your ground, and doing everything to stand, stand firm. Firmly planted with a purpose. And what is our purpose? Firmly planted with a purpose is to destroy the works of the enemy, and I've said this before, to invade the kingdom of darkness with our light. Amen? Amen. And Mark, that's what you're doing in the mornings and the afternoons when you're out there and you're, you're, you're drawing people to the Lord. Praise God. And this summer is going to be a bountiful harvest that's just going to come forth with um, just a salvation. And the prayer warriors are praying it in. Man, are they praying it in. Amen. So we take a stand.
Now in verse 26, David asked, first of all, David hears that the king is offering to anyone who is going to go out and meet Goliath and slay him, that he will give them great wealth. They can marry the king's daughter. He's going to He's going to do all these things for them. And David says, David questions many times, what's the king going to do for the, someone who slays Goliath? So David asks, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? David sees it like it is. He sees it like God sees it. This is a disgrace. You have the armies of Israel standing here, and you're afraid? Let's remove this disgrace. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David brings it right down to where we live. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy, not the armies of Israel, but the armies of the living God? You are reminded 
not only yourself, but the devil. Do you remember what God was this for me? If he did that for me, how much more is he going to do this for me? Amen. And the enemy bumps it up. He bumps it up. And you know what? God bumps it up. And we go another level. And we fight another battle. And we win another battle. So that the lion in our eyes is the same as in God's eyes. It doesn't exist. <laughs> what is your Goliath saying to you today? What words are being spoken to you? I'm not smart enough. Oh, Lord, it hurts. You know, I'm not anointed. Oh, that's a lie. Big lie. I'll never be able to do blah, blah, blah. Don't go there. I'll never, I can never be like Pastor Lucy. I can never be like Pastor Mike. I said that once. I can never be like Pastor Lucy. I can never be like Jerry. God said, why don't you be you? That's an odd idea. <laughs> At that point, I didn't even want to be me. <laughs> but I had to find out who I was in Christ. Just as any one of us had. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. So, Saul turns around and gives David his armor. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. This struck me. What king takes off his armor and gives it to a boy? Something was really wrong with that picture. That bothered me. Saul relinquished his responsibility as leader over the Israeli army. Right then and there, he didn't know it, but I believe that that was an analogy. Neither man did not understand this. But while Saul was relinquishing his kingship, he was handing it over to David. He was giving David his armor. I want you to understand something. I want you to see something here. Okay, it's really important that you see it. When you get entwined in sin, and sin wraps its horrible tentacles around you, and it pulls you down, and you find yourself in rebellion, you're going to find yourself immersed in lies. God's never going to forgive you. You're never going to get out of this. You're a nobody. Satan has nothing but lying words to speak to. And oftentimes we agree with those lies, and we spiral down in that sin. And when we spiral down in that sin, we open doors for things that we don't want to open doors for. And one of the biggest things we do is we separate ourselves from God. Amen. Because we don't want the conviction. We don't want to deal with the conviction. Say, I got an idea for you. How about really truly repenting? Amen. When we repent, we can be restored and back to our place. In the New Testament, we are covenant children of God. Of God, and they say that we are not slaves to fear. Amen. Okay? We are not slaves of fear that our God doesn't love us anymore, that our God has turned his back. Yes, he turned his face from Saul, but that was Old Testament, and Saul relinquished the kingship long before he gave his armor to David. Don't relinquish a child of the king in your armor, hang on to it, and Throw yourself at the mercy of God. Create in me a clean heart and renew, Lord, a bright spirit within me. I don't have the power in and of myself, Lord, to stand against some of those things. But when I am weak, you are strong. Yes. And this I know, you will never walk away from me. You will never forsake me. You will never leave me, no matter what throws, no matter how much of a prodigal, no matter how much I'm eating with the pigs. You never leave me nor forsake me. You wait for me with open arms at all times. So we get a picture here of the fact when sin spirals down. Now David has the armor on and he says, it's too big, I'm not a warrior. Now this struck me. He picks up the shepherd's staff, he gets five smooth stones going out to meet Goliath. 
One stone for Goliath, four for Goliath's brothers in case they came after him. Amen? So he goes out with the staff in his hand, truly a shepherd. Now that staff, that shepherd's staff represented something. It represents a shepherd of the flock of Israel. He was a shepherd, truly a shepherd. And what does the staff uh, represent? It represents rescuing and protection. David was coming out to rescue and protect the Israelites from Goliath. Do you realize that God is protecting and rescuing you from every diagnosis, from everything that has been spoken over you, from everything that has come at you? You turn to God, just like Helen did. You turn to God, and you see God move in your life. And how one scripture can change everything. Amen. One word from God can change everything. And David went out with that staff. However, the staff also is a rod, and the rod is authority. David had the authority of the living God to go out and slay the Goliaths that dared to defy God. Woo. Amen. Amen. Much in the same way, we have the same authority in God. When Christ died and was seated at the right hand of the Father, we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms, and we are above all principalities and powers. That's why Goliath are not big in our eyes then, because we have the authority over them. But what was David's biggest weapon that David walked out that day to meet his Goliath? His biggest weapon was confidence in God and no one else. What did he say? The God who delivered me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the mine who delivered me from the hand of the Philistine. He had the utmost confidence and faith that God would deliver. Amen? Not only did God would deliver, again coming back to the point, how dare he defy God? How dare the enemy defy God? We have that authority. So David goes out and he hits Goliath right in the head. Now, this struck me too. Not the stone, but this struck me too. <laughs> when the stone hit Goliath, don't you think when the stone with the horse that hit Goliath, that Goliath would have gone like that and fell backwards? Goliath fell face down. Why was that? Goliath bowed wow. to the armies of wow. God. Wow. Glory. Every knee shall bow. Oh, wow. Every tongue shall confess. The enemy bows. Amen. The enemy cannot prevail over you. When Christ went to the cross, we are victorious. The enemy cannot prevail over us because God. the enemy bowed. The word is trying to come out and I'm trying to say this. We've got to understand that when Christ took things at the cross for us, I'm sorry, but it just went for me. It's really this. No, Father, bring it back to remembrance. Well, that's it. You know, God despises us. He despised David when he saw David. Why does he despise us? Because we took his authority. When Christ went to the cross, that's where Christ redeemed us through the blood and returned the authority that we lost in the garden. Satan despises the fact that we have authority over him. And he must bow because he cannot prevail against the God that dwells in us. Not me, the God that dwells in me, the God that I serve, the God that we, so we just release ourselves to him completely and totally. Now, Goliath falls down, face down, bows before the Lord, and David runs over, takes Goliath's own sword. I love this, his own sword. All the boys in Sunday school love this story. And he took the sheep out, Goliath is still alive, and he kills Goliath, cuts off his head. And when David did that, well, I'll get there in a moment. When David did that, can you imagine the look on the Philistines' faces from there? 
Can you imagine the look on the Israelis' faces? Whoa! Let's get them, guys! And they went out and they conquered the Philistines. <coughs> and they left their bodies laid out there. Then they came back, and what did they do? They plundered the enemy's camp. They plundered the enemy's camp. Do we, when we get our victories, plunder the enemy's camp? We plunder. We take back what he's taken. We take back all of the things that he thought he could steal from us. Because we plunder the enemy's camp. We conquer. We have victory in Christ. Amen? Victory in Christ. Now Saul looks at David when he went out to meet Goliath. He sees the confidence. He sees the faith. He sees a young man with no armor, no uh, warrior experience whatsoever, simply a shepherd boy that comes down to one fact. He had confidence in his God. And that no Goliath will take from him what God has rightfully given him. Amen. 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 And then Saul says to Abner, whose son is that? And Abner says, I have no idea. When people see the confidence and the faith, and they see that you're going to stand firmly planted, not only are you going to stand firmly planted, but you're going to advance. You're going to activate. You're going to go forward. You're not even going to shrink back in terror. And people are going to say, whose father? Are you? Who is your father? We're yeah. I. Glory. Glory. Guys, my father. And I bring glory to my father, and I magnify the Christ that lives in me. Amen. Let's pray. And let's come and cast any Goliath that may be speaking to you this morning. I want you to understand those words when they're negative and they produce depression and they produce oppression and when you agree with that, you spiral downward, don't let the enemy take what God has given you. Every one of you sitting here, and I don't care, you can list a million things that's wrong with you, that you can't do. You could probably list a million failures, but I'm going to tell you, you are a success in God's eyes if you believe it. Amen? You are more than successful. Yes. I don't care if you have a learning disability. I don't care if, um, whatever. I don't care about any of that. Amen. The point is that God has called you with a purpose and plan in heart. And when you grab a hold of it, you grab that purpose, you grab that plan for your life, and you see it, and you agree with it, and you don't look at the finances, and you don't look at the issues, and you don't look at the problems, but you look at the solutions, and you look at the answers in the Word of God, things will change for you. You will become a David, slaying your Goliaths. You're not even your Goliaths. They're just Goliaths out there. Shut them up. Shut them down. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, for your Father, for your touch right now. There's people sitting here saying, Yes, God, I got that, I got that, I hear that, I hear that. I'm reaching out and I'm grabbing it because I don't want to live the way I've been living. I don't want to believe the way I've been believing. I want to truly, Lord, from my heart, believe what you have given me. Believe who I am in Christ. Believe what you're doing in me. And believe that I can conquer that Goliath, not through my own power or my own might, but through the Holy Spirit. I will, as Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by power, not by might, but by the Holy Spirit, that will be broken off in your lives. Sickness and disease has to be broken off in your lives. Fear has to be broken off in your life. Negativity, depression, oppression, anger, whatever it may be, it needs to be broken off your life right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus. And we can fresh fire go forth in this congregation. We need to fan into flames and fresh fire. We need to fan it in flames. Read up that prophecy three days afterwards. And that prophecy encourages you to fan the flames of the 
freshness of the Holy Spirit. And by faith, I believe every one of you have received it, whether you're receiving it or not. It's there because I have prayed that you hunger and you thirst for that. Peter's prophecy is at the bed table. And it would be good to read it. If it's gone, let me know. We'll get them to you. And we just pray right now in the name of Jesus for the continuation of the fresh fire that is mounting in this body of believers. Pastor Mike said he had a vision five or six years ago, a method of healing. Lord, we praise you and thank you that we get a vision and we see that and sickness and, and all of those things are under our feet. Lord, we praise you that you release within this congregation. We release all those reaching out to bring a hope. Say, I'm ready, God. I'm ready to go to the next level. I want what you have for me. I want to walk in uh, the day of kind of anointing. I want to walk. I want to be a giant slayer. Lord, that's what I want. It's yours now. Father, release it in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. 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 Amen.